We begin with a Fox News alert shutdown showdown. President Trump threatening to close the border with Mexico unless he gets his wall as lawmakers punt any solution to the new year and a Congress divided. This is outnumbered. I'm Julie Banderas. Here today, Fox News contributor Rachel Campos Duffy, the head of research at Bustle.com, and Fox News contributor Jessica Tarlov, National Review columnist and Fox News contributor Kat Timpf. And we welcome back to the couch to the host of you now it's called on PC on PC yes on PC yes, on Fox Nation have you yet. watched it you better Fox News contributor and professional wrestler Tyrus he needs no last name uh, yeah. how was your Christmas by the way um it was good it was fun I watched the yeah? uh, kids open presents and be unthankful so yeah. pretty much normal America <laughs> did you guys happen to watch the SNL skit of what Christmas is really like no okay please watch it it's just so funny because it's such a madhouse when you have kids and Christmas well, I'm a Grinch uh, so it's like my thing like uh, perfect I convinced my daughter I was stealing Christmas so oh that's um, great didn't work though Santa Claus got by me this year but next year <laughs> Santa, watch out you. Santa yeah. all right so we begin speaking of Grinches uh, in Washington day seven of the partial government shutdown no end in sight about a quarter of the government closed for business some 800,000 federal workers either staying home or working without pay at least for now the sticking point still President Trump's border wall of course the president today ripping quote obstructionist Democrats as he threatens to shut down the entire border but Democrats who are set to take over the house next week vowing no money is going to be going toward that wall the president so badly wants Nancy Pelosi's camp in fact saying they will move to swiftly end what they call the Trump shutdown but the soonest law Lawmakers get back to Washington is January 2nd. Meantime, the soon to be acting White House Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney, who is also the White House Budget Director, pinning the blame on Democrats, accusing them of acting bad faith. The Democrats have simply shut down the discussions. They did not even counter us. They left town, and I think the reason they did is because Nancy Pelosi, uh, in fairness, does not have the votes for the speakership yet. She cannot be seen by her party as being weak on, on uh, negotiating with Donald Trump. So we fully expect that until she is elected speaker and has locked that vote up, uh, we don't expect to hear from the Democrats again. They told us last night that they were not countering our last, our last offer. Peter Ducey has more on this from Capitol Hill. Hi, Peter. Julie, Republican House leaders are choosing to spend their last week in the House majority in their own houses. There's barely anybody here on the Capitol outside of reporters and tourists, although some of the Republican lawmakers who stayed back in the district are now calling on the Senate, where $5 billion of border wall money is stuck right now, to change their rules to put it through. Congressman Michael Burgess, a Republican from a border state, Texas, said this a little while ago. He said, this is so important and it is wrong for the United States Senate. The House sent them a bill a week ago with funding that would keep the government open until February, provide disaster relief, provide funding for the wall, and the Senate will not. The Senate had a motion to proceed, but then has done nothing. Look, I no, they don't have 60 votes, but they do have 51 votes. This is an emergency. They need to suspend their rules and get this done. The White House says Democrats decided to leave the district without making a counter offer to their latest pitch for a bill with border wall money. Well, Democrats say no offer with any border wall money will ever be good with them. They are insisting on a so-called clean continuing resolution that just funds the government at current levels, and they say that's the only way to go. There's also at least one Democratic member of Congress who is not a doctor, but has a diagnosis for the president he disagrees with. I think it's an embarrassment any time the government shuts down, uh, and this being no exception. But we ought to work at it until we get to an agreement where a majority say yes. Uh, but, um, and I think we had that uh, until the president, uh, you know, went off his meds and uh, who the hell knows what happened. Something else very interesting today. The incoming White House Chief of Staff, Mick Mulvaney, is trying to divide the Democratic leadership. He said today he thinks Chuck Schumer was on board with a deal, but that the problem is Pelosi. Julie. Peter Ducey, thank you very much. All right, uh, I want to bring in our panel now. And, and first of all, Rachel, let me ask you, um, the president has some very um, strong words for Democrats. I mean, he's basically saying that he will go to great lengths in order to get this wall if they don't uh, do what he asks. What chance in hell does he have, though, seriously, to do this, uh, considering by next week the Democrats are in control? You know the Democrats aren't going to give him his wall. I mean, what kind of bargaining power does he have? 
Well, his bargaining power will increase if he gets out and messages more. I think Twitter has been great, but it's not enough. Mm -hmm. And he needs to make the case. We just had a, a police officer die by, at the hands of an illegal immigrant um, just yesterday. And I think that was what, tragic news, it, yeah. it was absolutely tragic. Um, but this is more than just the crime that comes over the border. We have drugs that are coming over the border that are devastating communities. A lot of them, the red state communities that he uh, that voted for him, I mean, entire uh, counties that can't afford um, the child welfare that's happening because so many families are falling under under drug addiction and all kinds of problems right. that are happening. So I think he needs to really make a case to the American people and whoever wins this messaging war will win in the end. I mean, in, in the end, uh, America's losing, right? Nobody likes when the government shuts down. It's not a good thing. It's not a good look. But who gets the blame depends on who Americans trust. Tyrus, who is going to get the blame? I mean, is there any way that the Republicans are going to be able to uh, come out on top here and blame the Democrats for this? Who, who takes I think, the blame? I think, well, I think both parties are going to have to own this. Mm. I, I think the obstruction, we've been dealing with it for, what, 12 years now? We just don't have... The Senate just continues to be unpopular. They continue to do things to hurt people. The last paycheck, for, I believe, for government workers was December 26. So we have, what, two weeks before people start missing checks. So hopefully that starts to sink in. But for me, as, as a voter, I just look at it, the people in my, in my areas, in, my, in Louisiana and stuff like that. What are you doing for the American people? This argument, we're not being, no one's being fooled. We know what this is about. This is about the reelection. Democrats know he gets the wall. 2020 is a done deal. Mm. It's his. If he doesn't get it, they think that's their window. No. I heard her go, Wah! but yeah, I think. <laughs> It was it's, subtle. I'm yes. glad you picked it but up. Like, but like, that's what this is really about. <laughs> this is. I mean, do this... Democrats really think that? Do Democrats no. think that if he gets the wall, it's a done deal, and he gets a second? No, term? I don't think Democrats, after the 2018 results, think that anything is a done deal. For sure, denying the president the wall, which a number of people think is unreasonable, would be a boon to Democrats. But I would say that the polling, which is now out, there's a new Reuters poll that shows very clearly that Trump and the Republicans are getting blamed for this, 47 yeah. to 33 percent. On top of that, only 35 percent think that the border wall should be included in the spending bill, and only 25 percent sh uh, favor shutting down the government over this issue. So when Republicans come out there and they say, this is what the American people want, they're desperate for it, we need this, this is the most important issue, it absolutely isn't. People want the government open. They want Want affordable quality health care they want money in their pockets the border wall is something for the red meat base of uh, Donald Trump's red meat base there and he's got to let it go okay it's but he's not, he's not going to let it go no, no. I mean no. that, that's no. a fact I mean he ran on this and he's certainly not going to let down his conservative bases and certainly he's not going to let down Ann Coulter I mean, right <laughs> she seems to have a lot of control over the president a which is <laughs> are, they, are they following each other again? Uh, I don't know nice? I haven't but kept up on whether they're it following is very other, very popular with his base which is I'm sure there's people who blame President Trump for the shutdown who support him who don't care that there was a sh shutdown they may blame him but it's kind of a support slash blame because they see Republicans having backed down so many times in the past over issues like well, this. Well, look and at they healthcare. Say, oh, look. Exactly. It's like, exactly. Just like healthcare. Oh, look, he's fighting for us. He's fighting for what we want. So this is something that is very popular with his base. Is that enough? That's the question. I would say probably okay, not. But it went an election off 25 percent. Right. So it's also popular with the progressive wing of the party yeah. to not cooperate and, and negotiate on this issue. It's fun. I find it really interesting as a Hispanic woman that the left that the Hispanic advocacy groups mm. have not pressured the Democrats to leverage money for the wall in exchange for DACA. They have said forever that they want to do something for the DACA um, recipients. This is an opportunity. I mean, pr President Trump in, the, in just last year offered three times mm -hmm. um, the amount of DACA recipients uh, th than, uh, uh, than uh, Barack Obama did. Yeah. So this is somebody who's absolutely willing to, to negotiate on an that issue. That wasn't a clean bill, and Nancy Pelosi has been clear that it needs to be a clean bill because when the president offered that, there was a lot Lot tied to it, including limiting legal immigration, which people on both sides of the aisle are not necessarily. But this is a new situation. This but this is a new situation. Why aren't they? Why aren't they negotiating on this? I was actually surprised to this morning. We had Mick Mulvaney on Fox and Friends, and I asked him. I said, are, "Is somebody in Washington D.C. right now negotiating?" My husband is home, Congressman Sean Duffy. He's home, but I, I assumed that high-level people were. They're negotiating. He said no. He no. said they're, they're gone. They, they have no incentive. There is no, no right. incentive. We, at this we've point. seen this before. Like, it, it's funny to me because President Trump and President Barack Obama are so different, but their, their, their legacies are very similar. Nobody, everyone wanted to obstruct and not work with Barack Obama. 
No, hell no, we're not going to do it. Now they're doing it with Trump. And it's the same thing. The people end up looking like it's not the president. It's the Senate. It's the House. And it helps the president get reelected. The Senate and the House might change, trying to figure out what the right combination is. But this all plays into President Trump's hand in terms of reelection. Well, the problem here is I don't think that people are actually looking for a solution. They're not mm -hmm. at work. But if they were at work, it wouldn't even really matter. They're just saying, I don't want the wall or I do want the wall. And nobody's actually saying, OK, we have these opposing views. What are we going to do about it? Right. I'm not exactly. seeing an end OK, game but I'm inside. wondering if the Democrats saw this coming when the president this morning and you were talking about, you know, him using Twitter as a strong tool to try to get the message across or to get what he wants regarding the wall. But I wonder if the Democrats saw this coming when he tweeted that he and let's put it up, we will be forced to close the southern border entirely if the obstructionist Democrats do not give us the money to finish the wall and also change the ridiculous immigration laws that our country is saddled with. Hard to believe there was a Congress and president who would approve. Um, first of all, he has threatened this before, Kat. Um, it's not the first time that he's threatened to shut down the southern border and also to cut off aid to Mexico. Um, so, and he didn't take action then. Right. Is this threat any different? I don't think so. I don't think that's something that he would actually do. I don't think he would actually shut down the entire southern border. I think this is something that we see President Trump do repeatedly. He'll start with something really, really extreme to try to get it like a negotiation. Like, okay, well, I won't shut it down, but I'm, you know, I need money for the wall then. And she's trying to make it so it's a strong negotiating position. I don't think he would actually ever go through with that. I don't think he would as well, but there's more to that tweet where he actually talks about cutting off aid to the countries right. where these people which are I coming from. On, yeah. yeah, from Honduras, from Guatemala right. and El Salvador, which I don't know if you're trying to encourage productive solutions. I think saying to the countries that need us more than ever right now when they are facing the kind of upheaval and right. violence and drug trade unbelievable to say then we're going to cut off aid to you. What do you think is going to be the net result of something well, like that? First of all, $1.5 billion of trade goes across the board. So I agree with you, Kat. I don't think it's a it's a le legitimate, you know, realistic um, threat. But with regards to what you just said, uh, I, I just look at this and I say, you know, he just gave almost six billion dollars to the to the three countries in Central America, almost four billion to Mexico uh, for an infrastructure right. project that was supposedly so that this next caravan of, of migrants that are coming up can stay in Oaxaca and Chiapas and stay there. I mean, we are the, the American people are saying, give us five billion for the wall and you can get. But they a are lot of immigration. We don't care about the wall when they're saying open up the government. I mean, that's why actually I the disagree. The, I mean, I, I, it's polling. This is the thing. And he I ran know this one on this issue. But Jessica. no one is 25 percent is all that's supporting it. There are many more Americans than the ones who uh, want this. Let me this. just jump in real quick, because, he, you know, the, earlier this month, the U.S. pledged uh, a 10 billion dollars basically to help in other Central American countries and they had just made a deal with Mexico the amnesty deal that Kirsten and Nielsen the, the uh, Department of Homeland uh, Sec Secretary just announced about the fact that Mexico was going to actually take these amnesty seekers in exchange uh, in a deal with the United States what would it do to the deal that we just struck with Mexico if in fact the president went through with an executive order to close the southern border I mean that could blow up in our faces absolutely and that was a good deal that was made and I think right. it was a, a real win for the White House to have those asylum seekers um, taken care of across the border until they're which Mexico has even said I understand it would be a boon for us but Mexico has made it clear that they were actually right. it was put on them unilaterally that the president just came and said this is what we're doing now it wasn't okay. much of a deal all right we got to move on um, promises promises he did promise to shake things up we're talking about the president he promised to drain the swamp so about two years into the Trump presidency how has he changed the office and has it changed him plus we're going to be ending the year with a wild week on Wall Street after another crazy finish yesterday what this wild week of record ups and downs means for your wallet and for the economy heading into the new year a Fox News alert the Dow now up a bit capping off a week of wild swings in the market including the two record breaking days for the Dow the blue chip swinging more than 850 points in the final minutes yesterday before closing in positive territory and on Wednesday the Dow surged more than 1000 points in its largest single day rise ever to rally back from its worst Christmas Eve drop in history let's go live to Fox Business Network Jerry Willis at the New York Stock Exchange Jerry 
Yeah, it has been crazy. That's right. Stocks today moving back and forth today, though, over the flat line as traders' attention turns to 2019. The Dow right now of 25 points. The S&P 500 largely flat. The Nasdaq composite of about half a percentage point. Now, most of the S&P 500 sector is lower, with energy stocks hit the hardest. Traders cautious after Thursday's late-day surprise rally that added 260 points to the Dow Industrials after being down more than 600 points. That was the biggest single-day point rebound, 850 points in the blue chips, 120-year history. And that rounds out a record-setting week in which the index set new marks for a worst-ever Christmas Eve sell-off, followed by a record one-day gain of 1,086 points on Wednesday. Now, traders here blame year-end moves by portfolio managers. It is the end of the trading year, as well as computerized trading for volatility. Much of the trading occurring on low volume, so the number of players here low, but the market moves very big indeed. The big question, what next for 2019? Traders analyzing estimates for lower earnings by the nation's biggest companies for 2019 and slower overall economic growth expected at home and abroad. Guys, back to you. Thank you, Jerry. Okay. Welcome. You got it. Um, so let me ask you, Terrace. You said you were looking at your 401 as all this volatility was going up. And so you're a young guy. Um, not when you I look be... at my stocks. <laughs> <laughs> should you be worried? I mean, you're not exactly near retirement age. Yeah, um, I, I don't like roller coasters at the park because so, mm -hmm. they don't fit. Right. And I, I don't fit in this situation either. Like I, but I understand we, the, the general economy is good. And there's just a lot of moving and posturing going on, the stuff that I don't necessarily always compute in my brain. You're going to stay in the market? I, well, yeah, because I want my money back. I mean, the but, biggest mistake yeah. would be to do anything. If you yeah, have a 401 sometimes it's better just to watch. Just don't touch it. Yeah, don't, don't touch, touch it. it. Yeah. But, like, I play with um, a lot of stocks and stuff because I was trying to learn. I mean, I'm, you know, I work at Fox, and there's a lot of great business minds, and I'll be by the water cooler and be like, huh, what, which one? And I'll go <laughs> try it. So that's where I'm at in terms of... Okay. Just following Charles I'm, like, learning, I'm, 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 I'm like, <laughs> like, I learned how to play craps when I was 18. I got good at it when I was 30. I'm coming in, in, in late, and in the, the, I'm learning now as I'm, right. playing with, I'm playing with the stocks. Right. I know it's a good time to buy right now. Things are really cheap. Right, it's yeah, like, if it's like everything's to. on sale. Yeah. Yep. Make moves. So the, this president, catch he's been, you know, bragging about the economy right. for the last, you know, couple of years. It's been pretty good on his watch. Now this has happened, which adds a little bit of questions into the market and into what the future is in 2019. Should he take the blame if things go any worse? Well, it's interesting that he's very willing to take the credit, but he's not addressing the blame. I think right. we all need to agree that that is kind of uh, funny. I suppose, <laughs> because it was completely up to President Trump. This is why the market's doing so well and now that. But of course, as Tyra said, the economy is still a good economy. Right. This isn't some huge disaster. None of the experts that we talked to, I was on um, Maria's show on Fox Business this morning, Everyone said that there was really no reason to be super concerned. We're not heading into some no. sort of economic crisis right now. So it's a little bit different than what we've been used to with it just going up, 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 up. So yeah. that can be a little jarring, but it's not the kind of crisis that some people might be making it out to be. Yeah, I agree. Do you I, agree? I do agree, generally. And I think what can come out of this that is a positive is to have a more nuanced conversation yeah. about the economy, that it's not something where you don't say the market and the economy are synonymous, right? Because it, it needs to be broken right. down. You still have low unemployment. Um, you have seen some wage growth in certain industries. I think what happens with China and the trade war, whatever, sure. the March 1st deadline there is going to be important for all of this. But yes, yeah, so the volatility is upsetting to the average person who's going to go and look at what's going on um, on a day-to-day -day basis, but I'm hearing from experts just to not look on a day-to-day -day basis right. and right. check again in a week or two and see how you're doing. But it, when it right. is your 401k, that's something extremely right. concerning that we're not all as young as Tyrus. That's true. And <laughs> that's true. Listen, I don't, hey, listen, I'm with you on don't check every day. It's just like weighing yourself. Mm -hmm. If yeah. you weigh yourself every oh, day, I weigh myself you're going to go nuts. <laughs> just do it once a week. Don't, well, do, and, and don't weigh yourself once a day. So. <laughs> that's true, too. But 401ks, and yet I live in small town America where I still talk to small business owners, mm -hmm. people who own restaurants and, and small shops, and they say, it's never been better. Yeah. 
So what I do mean, we make of this? I don't think we should make much of it. I think that people are overhyping it. I think because of the president that's currently sitting in the White House, Good people point. are very quick to point blame. So now we're seeing what should be expected. I mean, we've been a bear market for nine years. Now, you know, we shouldn't all overreact because, you know, a 3% decline of all time highs is not that big of a deal. Right. As far as 401ks are concerned, no, if you plan on retiring, Tyrus, when are you retiring? Uh, how, how well, my years? spending and budgeting probably never. <laughs> okay. Well, so if you're never um, going to retire, yeah. you're great. And if you are going to retire sometime down the line, don't touch your 401k. Yeah. And you should also look at this as an opportunity to buy stocks at a low price, get a discount. And with, again, I mean, the market, the way that it's been acting, it, it's only normal to have a correction. I mean, you're right. going to see a correction in the housing market, and you should see, uh, expect to see a correction uh, on Wall Street. So I, I don't think it's... I would add to that, if the president doesn't want to take responsibility for a market in free fall, depending on the day, which I understand why he wouldn't want to. I think it would benefit him to lay off the Jay Powell criticism. Steve Mnuchin should not have had those public calls with the banks and released that statement. I mean, all these things that you're infusing into our psyche rattle markets and make things more difficult for you down the line. So I know that mm -hmm. the president certainly doesn't listen to me, and he's definitely not getting off of Twitter. But if you do want people to not be as excitable and freaked out frankly, as they are, it would be better to be quieter about your feelings about someone like Jay Powell. And right. I, I think, think the he... average American isn't thinking about Jay Powell or what the president said to no, him. No, but it's affecting I think the American 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 American. American. not happy about the interest rates being raised. They're not, they're not happy so, about I mean, that. We're talking about, about this believe. because our, our president is so transparent that guys like me who never cared about the stock market That's right. now care about it because right. we're learning about it. Like, oh, really? I didn't know the interest rate. Goal. That dude raised interest rate? Like, we're learning because of the transparency of the White House. So I, I think it's, it's a, a very good thing point, because Paris. more people are learning stuff that we normally wouldn't pay attention to. But I you're usually not. just check the score, and now I'm looking at NASDAQ and stuff. I'm paying attention to that stuff now. That's a wonderful thing that you're paying attention Thank to it, you. but I, I don't think that necessarily the quote transparency of this presidency is always a net benefit for him and the effect that he's trying to get out of it. The Fed is supposed to be independent, so when you're tweeting like you control the guy, right. it's not great. Agreed. Well, we can agree. You guys agree? Yeah, no, I agree, that? but I still like right. transparency. Ugly I like the or transparency pretty, too. I still like to look through it. All right. Well, the hunt is on for a man authorities say is an immigrant in this country illegally who shot and killed a California police officer. What we know about the suspect and his alleged ties to a violent gang as a community mourns a fallen hero. I did not know Christmas morning at four o'clock in the morning when I said goodbye to him and sent him off to his family that it would be the last time that I saw him. Fox News alert, the manhunt is on for a cop killer. Police say is an illegal immigrant. They say he gunned down Officer Ronil Singh in Newman, California on Wednesday during an early morning traffic stop. Officer Singh had immigrated legally to the U.S. from Fiji. He leaves behind a wife and a five-month-old son. Meantime, the suspect was last seen on surveillance video buying beer shortly before police say he was pulled over as part of a DUI investigation. This suspect is in our country illegally. He doesn't belong here. He's a criminal. We will find him, we will arrest him, and we will bring him to justice. William Lajeunesse is live in Los Angeles with more on this heartbreaking story. William? Well, Julie, I want to explain why police are not releasing his name. You know, he is described as a Hispanic male in the U.S. illegally. And it's not uncommon south of the border for a man to take his father and his mother's maiden name. But when arrested, some migrants will try to conceal their identity by inverting or omitting one name or the other so it is likely his prints match different names. Until it is sorted out and to protect others, police say they are not releasing his identity. But... Those security cameras do show him buying beer at a convenience store shortly before the shooting, wearing a black jacket, silver chain, black shoes. Moments later, Officer Singh stopped the suspect on a possible DUI in his pickup truck. No plates around 1 a.m. Wednesday. Minutes later, Singh radios, shots fired, I've been hit. He later died. He joined the Newman Police Department 11 years ago where he was one of 13 officers, well-known and liked. He recently tested to become a sergeant and then took the extra English lessons to be better understood on the police radio. Hours before the shooting on Christmas Day, he took this photo with his wife and their five-month-old son. His five-month-old 
he will never hear talk. He will never see his son walk. He doesn't get to hold that little boy, hug his wife, say good night anymore because a coward took his life. Since Kane, our partner, Sam, was there at the shooting, he will be retired and will live with Officer Singh's wife and son. There is a news conference scheduled for noon local time. The suspect, we are told, lived a short distance from the shooting in a trailer park, so a lot is going to be known about that individual. But the fact that Singh was here legally, the man who allegedly shot him here illegally, is fueling this debate, of course, about border security in Washington and immigration law in what is a sanctuary state. Julie. All right, William Lajanas, thank you very much. So, meantime, um, Homeland Security Secretary Kirsten Nielsen is set to visit ICE families near the U.S. Mexico border that handle migrant children. This after the deaths of two migrant children in U.S. custody this month, including an eight year old Guatemalan boy who died earlier this week. Nielsen will reportedly also travel to El Paso, Texas today, and Yuma, Arizona tomorrow. And DHS getting pressure from Capitol Hill as well. Top House Democrats Nancy Pelosi and Steny Hoyer. Both, along with several incoming House cha chairmen, are now calling for the agency to pressure and preserve all records related to the deaths ahead of planned hearings when the Democrats take control of the House next week. And in the Senate, the top Democrat on the Judiciary Committee, Dianne Feinstein, asking incoming chairman Lindsey Graham to hold hearings on these two deaths. This comes as President Trump continues to demand better border security, of course, in the, in the form of a wall. Uh, here is White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders. Certainly, that's an absolutely tragic situation, something nobody ever wants to see happen. It's one of the reasons that the president wants to fix our broken immigration system. Uh, it's a treacherous journey, and we don't want to see people go that route. We want people to come through the legal process uh, so that they're not putting their lives on the line to do this. But this is the very reason we have to take away incentives for people coming in the wrong way and making that treacherous journey. Um, and we need Congress to help us, particularly Democrats in Congress, to step up and actually do their jobs. There are also now reports coming out today. A family member of the boy's father said that he did not leave Guatemala seeking asylum. Instead, he left to escape crushing poverty and believed it could be easier to enter the U.S. accompanied by a child. Um, and that is new news that we find out today because there has been a lot of uh, finger pointing to U.S. Border Patrol agents and government officials blaming them for the death of this little boy who came here sick, which we're now learning he was basically used as a tool to get into this country by his own father, Tyrus. Well, I mean, as a father, that's gut-wrenching that you would use your children for anything. You should want to seek the best life for them, whatever is possible. But <clears throat> I think we are very lucky because of that we are the United States that we've only had two deaths. I think that it's, if you look at the means of the way that they're getting here, the risks that they're taking, uh, oftentimes they're, when you see the children, they're in like maybe a t-shirt, pair of pants, they're malnutrition, like they're going on these really long journeys, they're exerting them that even an adult would have a hard time with. And these children a lot of times are being, in some cases, not even taken with actual family members, cousins, people they've just literally have just taken. Or alone. Or alone. Yeah. So like we're just going to, so <clears throat> I think the fact that we're looking, like yes, any death is terrible, and we, and it, it, I think it's unfair to look with with wincing eyes at immigration that are doing the best they can given the situation. This is a horrible situation to be in. They're dealing with people who are willing to do anything to get over, and I get it. I grew up in California. I, I get it. I've seen it. I, I, the, the difference between being on the Tijuana side and being in San Diego is unbelievable. The opportunities. So I understand the risk. But you, when, you make the, when you take those risks, you also are risking the lives of your children, your spouses by when doing things illegally and, and opening yourself just to the elements right. and, and being in, incarcerated stuff because you're breaking the law. Things are going to happen, and it's unfortunate. But there's no, there should be no finger pointing at the United States. Rachel, what does DHS need to do, especially with the CBP, um, basically saying that it needs to uh, completely overhaul the situation and how migrant children are dealt with? Well, first of all, we need to stop, uh, we need to do something about policies that are actually incentivizing people to bring children as a means to get in. So we need to look at that and go, what are we doing as a country 
to I mean it's there's 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 nothing compassionate about that um, it's 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 really wrong um, but also I mean the, the border patrol um, the, the facilities that are housing them once they get over we're overwhelmed um, I think I, I saw William Largeness um, or, or, or maybe it was Rick Leventhal earlier today saying that in August alone um, you know, 40-some thousand illegals were arrested. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, these are enormous numbers of people. And how can we as a country manage this? Right. Um, and, and that's why it's really interesting to me to see the Democrats just say, I don't want to do anything to solve this problem. Um, Nancy Pelosi seems much more concerned with getting her speakership than she is in solving this problem. And I think she bears as much responsibility if she doesn't get on get on, on board with the rest of the country and the rest of the members of Congress to find a solution. Just saying, I'm not going to build the wall, I'm not going to do anything, I'm not going to change these policies, that's, that's wrong. Kat, I mean, the Democrats say that they do want to have um, tighter border security, which is why they're putting forth $1.6 billion, which is several billion dollars short of what the president wants. But when it comes to enhancing border security, what is it exactly that they want to do in order to protect migrant children and is a DACA deal is that what they're waiting for is that what Nancy Pelosi wants before she makes any kind of compromise with Republicans well there's that's one thing that they're waiting for and I do believe that that's <laughs> sincere but I think that also a lot of it has gotten lost in just wanting to oppose President Trump because mm -hmm. it's President Trump a lot of the same Democrats who have said oh they want fences or they want some kind of barriers in the past including we saw Hillary Clinton back in 2016 going against the wall when she had supported the same sort of thing when she was in office except just not calling it a wall. Right. I think a lot of it has to do with just being opposed to President Trump rather than having some sort of actual opposition to it in itself. I mean is that the problem that the, the Democrats want their own you know policy pushed through and so they're not going to necessarily pay attention to the wall issue because they want issues like DACA and, and other immigration policies that they feel passionately about? I mean, where, where, where do Democrats stand on this? Well, I think Democrats stand in the place where they're first and foremost concerned about these migrant children and the family separation policies, the DACA kids, of course. Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer talked about that a lot before the midterm elections as being a priority moving into this new Congress. There are certainly a number of Democrats on record saying they support fencing barriers of some kind, including Obama, Biden, Hillary Clinton, Dianne Feinstein, all of them. Uh, these are also people who were members of the Gang of Eight or the Gang of Six, which were compromised policies that a lot of hardline Republicans Republicans just call amnesty, but they really weren't. It was to send more border agents down to the border than President Trump actually was supportive of doing. It did include some fencing and protection, but now we actually have an issue. We need more lawyers down there. We need more judges down there. We need a way to speed up the process for these asylum seekers, which is their right to seek it if they have credible fear, um, which is about 90% of them are coming in the in here and claiming that and we need to make sure that people can be seen as soon as possible but Kirsten Nielsen has a really tough road ahead of her because the images and the idea of a child dying in our care is something that rattles all of us to our core right. and frankly <coughs> sways elections. Tyrus is right though and we have to move on on this the fact that more people have not died that too and it's tragic yeah. because they were so close to each other nearly back to back right. um, that more weeks. people have not died um, is sort of a miracle considering the treacherous conditions that these families go through uh, traveling to the United States um, and risking their lives and their children's lives which is the saddest part of it all um, former attorney to President Trump Michael Cohen denying a report he traveled to Prague ahead of the election something mentioned in that Steele dossier so what do we make of that we're gonna discuss plus the president's current attorney Rudy Giuliani once again slamming the Russia investigation saying President Trump is done answering any more questions and calling for Mueller to be investigated Mueller we're going to tell you why next. President Trump's former lawyer, Michael Cohen, denying a new report that appears to put him in Prague during the height of the 2016 presidential campaign. McClatchy reporting that a phone linked to Cohen sent signals to cell towers in the Czech capital in the summer leading up to the election. This seems to lend some credibility to the claims in the Steele dossier, which reported a link between Trump's campaign and Russian election meddling. But Cohen is pushing back on the report, tweeting, quote, I hear Prague, Czech Republic is beautiful in the summertime. I wouldn't know as I have never been. Mueller knows everything. 
This coming as one of the president's <coughs> current lawyers, Rudy Giuliani, slammed Robert Mueller's Russia investigation, telling the Hill the special counsel should be investigated for destroying FBI evidence and saying the president is done cooperating with the probe. You are not answering any more questions from these people. They are outrageous activity. I'm, I'm, uh, uh, you know, we we did enough. We we did everything. We gave them 1.4 million documents. We've uh, not raised privilege for 38 witnesses. They've gone on uh, from what they what they started with to you know investigating cases that end up with 14 day jail sentences for Papadopoulos. They're seeking no time for General Flynn. Okay, so that was a big surprise yesterday, seeing that McClatchy piece. We hadn't talked about Michael Cohen in Prague quite some time. Tyrus, do you think there's any chance that this actually <laughs> did happen? Do I think there's a chance that Michael Cohen might have been lying? <laughs> that he, that he might have left that out, and now that it came out, he's like, no, I told you everything. I never <laughs> been a pro what, my phone was there? I mean, he literally sounds like the average guilty guy caught at the strip club. You it know, wasn't just, me. It wasn't me. It was another <laughs> guy taking photos with her. I, I think he's literally one of the most untrustworthy human beings on the planet, which is really tough to do. Um, <clears throat> so every time something comes out of his mouth, you're always going to be like, is he lying? I mean, the cell tower caught you on the phone. Um, right. Unless you lent your phone. Because I know all <laughs> the time I lent my the phone. The they just... There's a lot of crazy stuff that's in the dossier that yeah. I think people, that's kind of unbelievable. But that's it. I think Rudy Giuliani, you know, he makes a good point. There are big pieces of evidence from text messages between Strzok and Lisa Page that are missing. Why are they missing? So he, I think, one, the American people want this investigation to end, so would he just be done already, just get it out there? But two, I do think he has to be, um, he needs to answer. I mean, the IG has said there are huge gaps in evidence, and where has this evidence gone? I don't think people, unless you're a, a real hardcore deep stater, think that Robert Mueller is destroying evidence. I think that most people believe that yeah, he has more documents way, yeah. in his office than is humanly possible and that right. he would not do something Why like that. Why would the IG say that? I, the IG the, it's pretty legit, too. The idea, he does, absolutely, but saying that it was Robert Mueller and his team that did it, I don't know if there was some break in the chain of command there, but that seems pretty far-fetched. Now, if the Prague story is true, why didn't that come up at all in the Cohen sentencing the SDNY and the Mueller memo just right. a few weeks ago. That's right. what confuses me. That's what I want to know, too. I really don't understand. And this whole thing is just crazy because we have <laughs> unverified sources on one side, and then we have a complete liar on the other side. So I don't really see a <laughs> well, credible there are anonymous situation. Sources, anonymous sources. Right, uh, right. Anonymous sources, rather, on the one side. So I'm not really sure. This seems like a pretty huge thing that would have certainly been included. I have absolutely no answer. I've been thinking about that all day. I have, I have no answer. idea why. I'm What's a, your answer, Tyrus? America, any time Giuliani or Cohen talks, just don't listen. Just pretend like it didn't happen. Like, both guys are just, uh, Giuliani, I never, he says one thing and then he comes back another. I really feel like he's just a, a dear friend and not really in the meetings. I really think, like, <laughs> yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like, he might be in the office outside of the meetings with Trump and his lawyer team, but I don't think he's at the head of the table. <laughs> Julie, so, what do between, you think? <laughs> uh, between the two of them, I just want to say, whenever they, those two talk, check out the sports but there page. There are real implications you know, absolutely, for what's going on with Michael Cohen. I mean, what do you make of it? Michael Cohen's already in hot water. I don't know what incentive he would have to lying any more than he already has. I mean, Maybe he just loves it. I don't know. I, or just he One likes those... to become the center of attention. Or he just told so, enough. But, but, I mean, if, again, like, why would we not have heard about this before. Well, in, Lanny in Davis, sentencing. who was his lawyer, did say that he didn't <clears throat> go to Prague, but he's not his lawyer anymore, and he has said that he doesn't know what Michael Cohen said to Mueller in those 70 hours of testimony that he gave to him, which does leave an opening that it would be feasible. I think I think that the American people really don't care about this until the actual report from Mueller comes out. I, I don't think everybody think wants Michael Cohen to go away. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, in March, he will. Yeah, right. That's yeah, for the... some time. <laughs> yeah. That is sure. true. Well, what sure. I heard that. Yeah. Yeah. I heard that five <laughs> months right. ago. <laughs> well, let's talk about the president some more. <laughs> Two years in, and questions over how much the president has changed the office of the presidency and the workings of Washington. Whether those changes are good, bad, and if they are lasting, we'll debate it next. He did vow to change Washington and drain the swamp. So how much has President Trump changed the office and the political culture in our capital two years in? 
A new piece in the AP says, quote, taking a wrecking ball to decorum and institutions, Trump has changed in ways both subtle and profound how Washington works and how it is viewed by the rest of the nation and world. <coughs> Presidential historian Doug Brinkley is quoted in the piece saying the next president will not model himself in the style of President Trump. So, Tyrus, what do you think? Has Trump changed the game forever or no? He's put the glitz and glam on the White House, man. <laughs> like, uh... He's turned it into entertainment. It's the number one TV show is politics. That's what everyone's talking about. That's why we're sitting here, like, and millions of people watch. He's, it's no longer Monday Night Football. You know, it's, it's Monday Morning Tweet. Like, he's changed <laughs> the game in terms of good, bad, or indifferent. Everybody is a political expert now. I can literally walk outside that door and wait two seconds, and somebody will come up to me and want to start talking politics. It used to be sports. It used to be who's going to win the Oscars. Now it's like, what's he going to do next? So the next president, we're going to be very bored. It's going to be a lot of, huh. But I'm that sure he'll is, I mean, We have kept very busy, and it is very entertaining to do our jobs for the last two years. I mean, yeah. there's never a day Question. where it doesn't. So you're very right yeah, in that. Been like, what that we it got? will be uh, very boring, right, Jessica? I mean, yeah. you have to admit. I look forward to it. Yeah, <laughs> you want to be bored? Yeah, say that, but everyone, well, you know. Well, here's the deal. Changed accessibility forever. I honestly right. think that he has there's changed There's a level forever. of transparency yeah. that we've never and seen before in accessibility to our leader. But I think, you know, look, and I say this, I come from reality TV, so it's kind of fascinating. He wasn't just a reality TV star he was a producer and so I think that he brings that skill set to to the job what's interesting is I have friends who are very pro-Trump and I have friends who are Republicans who really don't like him and what they don't like um, those Republicans who don't like him it's not the policies they actually like his policies they are people who really like decorum yeah. they really like um, sort of the, the that whatever it is that mystique that came with the office and Donald Trump is an open book he tells you what he thinks at all moments of the day and in that regard I think um, in the next election whether or not the person has that sense of decorum or not they are going to be expected to be um, transparent I don't think talking points from the RNC or the DNC are gonna work anymore people do want to know what their leaders are thinking Jessica what do you think I, I do think there's a lot of validity to that point and one of the positive, or maybe the one positive that I think out of this is that people are running for office who might not have thought that they could before. <laughs> so well, that's, that's people coming from the private sector who have a more checkered past. I mean, if you think about, and there's a movie coming out about Gary Hart, for instance. Um, Boy, and if, if he, he wants to think, <laughs> right, exactly, he'd be, he'd be a saint <laughs> nope, no by problem. these standards. And that is a, certainly an interesting development and in that maybe will bring more people into the fold who have something important to say to the American people and be great representatives. But in your lead-in, you also mentioned draining the swamp, which clearly has not happened right. here. I mean, there are more cabinet secretaries being accused of grifting and, you know, they're employing their families and they're, you know, stealing from the American public with their private jet travel and all of that. I mean, he brought in a crew of his buddies like Betsy DeVos and Wilbur Ross and Zinke and these guys. Um, so in the sense of him going in there and taking out the elites, he didn't. He put in just business elites, Different Wall elites. Street elites. And that always uh, happens uh, whenever you bring happen. your homies into anything. If that's, we have a rule in wrestling. I don't know. Past administrations <laughs> haven't had this many members of the administration. Well, the, the, the family, members. Training, family members. The, nepotism is back. The the lobbyist lobbyist you. You don't bring them in because they maybe, mess up the house. Maybe nepotism, but the lobbyist class does not have the same access and, and are, are much more frustrated um, in terms of getting what they want um, from the Trump I don't know. Shanahan is now going to be uh, replacing Mattis, Ryan Zink. I got to wrap. I got more, though. Right. <laughs> we got more outnumbered in just a moment. All right, before we go, we have to tell you about Tyrus's new gig. He, along with Britt McHenry, hosts the Fox Nation show, UnPC, that streams every night at 6 p.m. Eastern. And you can get it on by logging on to foxnation.com, and you should. My show's on there, too. Yeah, you should watch it back to back. <laughs> watch it back to back. Thank Go by Heiko. That's first. right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to Tyrus. We're back Monday at noon Eastern. Now here's Julie Banderas in for Harris.